Welcome to the very first future session of ICDRI 2022. I welcome to your future, which is unknown, which is right here, and which we don't yet have a handle on. Futures thinking and foresight tools is an approach that's critical in building forward and building back better as the world navigates through uncertainties and unknown unknowns, as we said earlier. This session led by the Asian Development Bank will introduce us to the tools, the mindset really, to inform practices and policies for a more resilient tomorrow. Let's hear from young Ikit from the Philippines, who's lived through, who's survived, who's rebuilt post the mo one of the most uh, severe typhoons to visit the Philippines. On December 16, 2021, our country, Philippines, was hit by a super typhoon ride. It turned out to be one of the strongest typhoons that hits Philippines and the second deadliest disaster globally in 2021. My hometown, Chargao Island, was destroyed by this typhoon. Three days after the storm, when I landed in my hometown, I was completely devastated to see the destruction. It had destroyed homes, cut off power lines, disrupted water supplies, and destroyed communication networks. What used to be a beautiful green coconut tree-filled island was now brown and broken. Houses were completely turned down. Trees were uprooted and snapped in half. The roofs of my brothers and parents' houses were blown away. Up to 80% of the island was destroyed. It was overwhelming. While all this was happening, I had only one thought in my mind. What if this happens again? After the storm, the relief operations were quick. Thanks to the private sector, NGOs, and local businesses who worked with the local government in the recovery, everyone put efforts into rebuilding and so did our family. Thanks to our donors. We were able to distribute relief goods to about 10,000 families, construction materials to over 1,000 families, facilitated in building over 100 houses, as well as six boats for the local fishermen. We were thankful to get cellular signal in less than a month and electricity back after three months. I'm so grateful to everyone who helped and organized relief efforts all over the country. The work was hard, but gratifying, and the resilience of our community during those difficult times is something that I will always be proud of. But I still ask myself the same question. What if this happens again? The answer, I believe, lies in the fact that in the future, the government must invest more into disaster risk management so we can be better prepared for future disasters. What happened to my island home was a wake-up call. Now, we have backup generators, satellite phones available in the island, as well as water filtration stations, so we can have better access to clean drinking water if we face another disaster like this. But there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. We need to have more information and funding to build typhoon-resilient homes and infrastructure. We need to have proper evacuation centers and well-thought evacuation plans for areas prone to natural disasters. We want to believe in a future where we don't have to worry about the thought of this happening again, but instead feel assured that we are more prepared than ever. Happy to be here. I'm Susan Ross from the Asian Development Bank. I'm the Chief of Knowledge Management. And I think what we want to illustrate with this video from ECIT is that number one, the future, our youth is suffering from the disasters that are caused by the climate, consequence of climate change often. And also that the youth is the one that has to be resilient as we are now 
uh, aiming to actually create more resilient infrastructure and more resilient communities. What this means also is that we have to engage the youth and the communities in the kind of work to imagine the impossible futures that are probably upon us, right? Who would, who would have thought that something like this happens in Chiagao? Maybe for everyone who doesn't know Chiagao, Chiagao is a tropical island. It's one of the tourist destinations and uh, Ikit is uh, actually a silver medalist, a, a surfer, mm -hmm. and she created her life there with her family and all of this was now destroyed. Yes. So I think we see the human consequences um, in this. And um, what, what we do in ADB is to now really think about a more creative way to imagine um, scenarios for the future mm -hmm. and engage with communities um, on that. And uh, we've done this actually in the last couple of years with around 12 different member countries. Mm -hmm. And as you can imagine, it creates a level of uh, discomfort, you know, to come with traditional uh, data and analytics and now say, well, let's think about stories and let's yeah. think about narratives and yeah. let's think about the impossible and yeah. let's create these kind of participatory approaches. So that's what we wanted to share. And I have a question for you now, Kamal. What do you think is, is changing in the way we are planning in for infrastructure? I will say two things. Uh, the first thing I'll say is that, uh, Master planning, as we've known it traditionally, its days are numbered. You know, a deterministic plan which assumes that there will be a certain trajectory of growth, a certain trajectory to risk, uh, is no longer something that could work. So, we really have to come up with a new imagination in master planning, which is more iterative, which is more attuned to what is actually happening on the ground almost in real time and something which is um, a, a more dynamic process. Uh, that is the only way we can go beyond managing disaster risk to also dealing with uncertainties. So, mm -hmm. I think that's my first point. My second point is what you alluded to is really a people centric approach where you don't look at people as subjects of your intervention. but principal actors and it is something which we have to really put it on the ground in action and not just pay lip service to. You know, we have, I'll give you an example, we have colleagues in the studio here from Nepal. Uh, in 2000, uh, I'll give you two examples from yes. Nepal. Uh, you know, in 2015, there was an earthquake. Of course, there were losses from the earthquake. Yes. But what we don't know is the work that was done in Nepal. 15 years prior, you know, for 15 years prior to the earthquake was so people focused, you know, I mean, when they developed their earthquake scenario, it was not about, you know, what is the peak ground acceleration and what is the intensity. It is about, you know, it is a really a scenario which talks about what will happen to people. people because when they wrote the scenario like that, it galvanized action by people. And that is the reason the losses, what could have been in 2015 was much less than uh, what happened in 2015 was much less than what could have happened. And now taking the same thing on to planning of uh, reconstruction uh, processes, you know, Nepal's reconstruction of housing is one of the best yes, examples yes, exactly. of people focused, you know, and I would like to say that, you know, government of India was one of the partners in it as well. So we had the honor of learning from, from Nepal in this. And the whole thing was, you know, you, you work with communities in uh, identifying the levels of damage, you come up with appropriate technologies at the local level, and you, you also build capacity at the local level. You know, Nepal, I, I would reckon that it has probably the highest number of women masons. Yes. Uh, who, yeah. who participated in recovery and reconstruction program. Tell me which other country has that. That was possible because the whole planning process yes. for reconstruction was people centered. Yes. It was not about the reconstruction authority. And I think uh, the, the lights are blinding me here in the studio, but I think the former CEO of the reconstruction authorities in the audience, 
he w- he would tell you that you know it was not about you know uh, Kathmandu. Yes, it was. It was about area. out there yeah. in Gorkha. Yeah. You know where where people were affected. You know where they needed help, and they know what they need. You know, yes. it's not people in Kathmandu, and and so we have examples, and I'm sure there are examples from mm-hmm. other countries as well that th- it it's is here. possible. Yeah. We just have to stop being lazy. Yes. Uh, lazy yes, planners. Exactly, and not and planning from the desk. Engage in right? the conversation. <laughs> yes, exactly. I think that's yeah. another important message. We have to get out in the field, especially yeah. in these uh, very high level global conferences yeah. and really talk to the people who yeah. are uh, most affected often. So maybe that, thank you, Kamal. So yeah. I think we are moving now to our uh, discussion, the panel discussion, because we want to make sure we showcase some of the examples and how we can combine narratives, creativity, engaging with communities, and then the hard science and data driven approaches. So I'm now um, handing over to my colleague, uh, Bama. She's coming in from Mongolia, actually. That's where she's based right now. And she will lead us through the conversation now with our experts. So Bama, over to you. Thank you, Suzanne. And thank you, Mr. Kishore, for setting the context. And we would like to highlight in our session why it's important to, why future sneaking and foresight is important and how it can add value in decision-making process we will we will focus on the how it can influence decision making and how it has been used in the long term planning and then take you through specific applications in the transport sector and climate change our session consists of two parts so first we will have a panel discussion covering different examples of application and then in the second part we will do a demo session to introduce one approach that is used in the climate change adaptation and with that, now I would like to introduce our panelists. We have Shaquille Ahmed, futurist, educator, and storyteller from Ridiculous Futures, Danny Robertson, senior project manager from Climate Work Center, and our colleague Arndt Hussar, senior public management specialist from ADB. So let me start our discussion from Shaquille. Shaquille, you worked with different organizations exploring the future of health, future of education, and future of work looking into 2030 and 2040 time horizon. Will you please share with with us how future thinking and foresight approaches can really influence policy making and most importantly, reforms? Mm, Sure, Uh, thank you. And I'm just thank everyone for giving me the opportunity. It's also Eid Mubarak, so a greeting to you all um, for that. And um, yeah, and I think um, one one thing to note, note that of course there, there, very many different ways in which we can influence policymaking reform. And I think I would like to also echo uh, Kamal Sir's point on not relying on traditional forms of master planning, um, but but then being but then trying to apply dynamic forms and then being people focused, even in our approach of facilitation and gathering. Right. And I think future thinking, um, this field, and if you notice that every time I say future thinking, I'm going to use it in plural because there's not just one future, there are multiple different futures and there are alternative futures. And of course, some features are more, more likely to happen and some are less likely to happen. And, and then how do we actually um, bring about that conversation in the policymaking room uh, is one thing that we futurists um, nowadays call ourselves facilitators. We're not fortune tellers, right? Uh, we also call ourselves game, game designers because we are really uh, quite cognizant of how we actually allow people to interact with each other in the room. And sometimes I feel that it's not the the, mass, the content of the master plan that's most important or the content of the futures report that comes out is most important, but the process that we go through on how we engage with each other. And you'll notice that, of course, in futures thinking, we usually have a slightly longer timeline. And we should think about, we think about not, not a thousand, uh, thousand years into the future necessarily. I mean, of course, there's macro history, but then 20 to 40 futures is a good timeline um, that we look at. But of course, a lot of, I understand a lot of, Systemic uh, policy planning is uh, on a five years or to do, or at least a 10 years uh, uh, basis. But at least uh, future thinking allows us to think about these different scenarios and help us to ref- sort of backward plan that, okay, like if this is going to happen in 2050 or this is what we want in 2060, it needs to happen in 2030, 2025 or, and, um, and now. And, um, and like I said, like, irrespective of the work that we did with our prime minister's office on the features of education or whether it's the features of health with BRAC. Um, I mean, I think one thing that we always noted is that who's not in the room and who do, who do we need to be in the room? 
And I think, um, I mean, of course, um, policymakers are important, but even the people who are always think, making us think about new worldviews, new, uh, yeah. like even if it's philosophers or intellectuals, even if it's storytellers, these are also important people that can also be potentially in the room. Come back to the point, Bama, um, probably later on in our conversation. But I think I just want to probably um, and and uh, kind of wrap up on, on this note that when it comes to like um, policymaking, I mean, I mean, of course, there are these regular conversations that we have about the future. But I feel like a lot of the methods and approaches that at least I'm aware of in the future thinking field really helps us to think about scenarios that we haven't really uh, focused on. And, and I'll note that my, the name of my entity is called Ridiculous Futures, hmm. because uh, the idea is that any useful statement about the future should at first appear to be ridiculous. And I think sometimes it's important that we to have conversations about things that, that may sound weird. Like even if COVID-19 might have sounded weird five years ago to a lot of people, even if scientists were telling us that it's going to happen, it's going to happen. Right, and I think even now with climate change, you can see that um, people are telling us that it's going to happen, but to some people, um, it might just seem like a, a distant reality. But if, but of course, um, it's important that that all of us in the room, including the policymakers, everyone starts thinking um, differently, uh, differently, uh, uh, so that at least uh, we can think about novel and new ways to even act in the present. So I'll just stop there uh, for now. Uh, um, yeah. Thank you, Shahil. Uh, you mentioned about the world worldviews and thinking mm -hmm. differently. And a lot of the futurists talk about the importance of narratives to, to change these worldviews. Mm -hmm. So how would you frame the strategic foresight helping to form these alternative narratives to engage different stakeholders? Mm -hmm. uh, thank, you. thank you for that. So I think... Um, I mean, I think my very first exposure to the field, and, and I recognize that the field of foresight and future thinking might seem pretty new to, to a lot of people. It's a trending topic indeed. But I think um, my very first um, experience was in 2012 when I think a futurist named Sohel and Atullah, I was, uh, we did a workshop on the futures of um, Brack University, uh, for example, in 2030 uh, back then. And I think um, we, we, we followed this process called uh, the six pillars of future studies. And I think there's one particular powerful tool that I guess you guys can even Google up later on called, called causal layered analysis um, that really helped me think about like I, we use the metaphor of an iceberg that that whatever is happening around us, around us um, like whatever news headlines we see like that's the tip of the iceberg so like uh, like the video of um, what was happening in, in the Philippines is really what's uh, on the surface right the, the disasters that are happening the people that are mobilizing and a lot of the times when we want to like address uh, disasters we come up with new systems and new policies, um, but we see that sometimes we might have well-intentioned policies that don't get implemented. And I think the reason why is that causal layered analysis helps us think about to go deeper uh, into the uh, layers of the iceberg, that there are particular worldviews and philosophies that if they remain the same, then even if you come up with new systems, things won't change. So for example, uh, when it comes to violence against women, as long as we have a male part patriarchal worldview, right, irrespective of what, what policies we shift, um, the reality does not change. And I'm sure even in, I mean, even Naomi Klein might even talk about in her book, right? Uh, this changes everything, that there are particular worldviews. Like if it's a profit-focused worldview all the time, then things won't change, right? Things, I mean, you may come up with new systems, but if you are, if you're just uh, hoping that un unbridled capitalism will help help everything, I mean, that's her, her perspective, then things won't change. That's just an example. But of course, we talk about the shift in mindset and shift in um, worldviews. How does that change? And that, that comes the, the deepest layer of the iceberg is stories, is myths and metaphors, right? So there are particular stories and culture that help shift our mindsets. So if there's the story that men are better than women or men are stronger than women will always uh, lock you into the patriarchal mindset, right? Or the story that, um, that money is best, right? It will probably think about, uh, will put you into, into a particular mindset. So the story needs to change, right? The story has to shift from probably that everyone has rights on this planet, everyone is equal, uh, irrespective of who you are, or the story that that our, our incentives or, or our notions of success in life have to be not just driven by profit, but even by whether it's gross national happiness or gross national inspiration. Uh, there can be other ways in which we can uh, measure um, uh, this world. And I think um, 
futures thinking uh, in this particular case is really helping us also talk about that what sort of elements in our culture are help perpetuating the systems that we cannot change. Right? And I think that's a, that's a novel way that we don't usually talk about in, uh, in those rooms. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Shaquille. And linking to your conversation, I would like to invite our next panelist, Danny Robertson, Senior Project Manager from Clyde Work Center. So Danny, you worked on the long-term strategies and supported the Tongan government to develop their low emission development strategy up to 2050. And as of today, there are only 51 parties that have submitted their long-term low greenhouse gas emission development strategies to UNFCC as, as part of the Paris Agreement. So will you please share with us how, how does these futures thinking and foresight approaches support countries with their long-term climate mitigation planning while also considering adaptation and resilience? Sure. Thanks so much, Bama, and thanks to CDRI and ADB for having me and for the previous speakers as well. I think Shaquille and I have got a lot in common, so um, it's great to be here. And I also would like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the traditional owners, past, present and emerging of the lands and waters of the Wurundjeri people of uh, Melbourne. I'm calling in here from Australia. And so, as Bama already mentioned, uh, 51 countries have submitted their long-term strategies to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, or the UNFCCC. There are three main reasons, as, as Shaquille already touched on, on why this long-term thinking and foresight theory are really helpful in climate change planning. Uh, firstly, they're transformational. They really encourage that transformational thinking. A long time horizon, you know, out to 2050 or mid-century offers the opportunity for a country to move beyond some of the incremental thinking and planning that's happening currently. Uh, they can set an ambitious future. Sometimes that uh, frees up some of the political constraints of, of future uh, or short-term planning and then from that ambitious future can can backcast to, to estimate the, the pace and the scale of change that's needed. Um, secondly, long-term thinking and planning can encourage holistic planning, so mid-century planning across key policy areas of mitigation, adaptation, climate resilience, infrastructure and sustainable development using this countries can design and implement a pathway that considers the interaction between those classically siloed sectors and really think about the synergies, trade-offs of all of its national priorities, which um, isn't, isn't happening as well as it could be. And then that practice really of considering the trade-offs and benefits is really critical if we're going to become more skilled in decision-making under uncertainty. Uh, lastly, I'll talk to kind of the long-term planning and foresight can help to avoid lock-in and lock-out, which I think is important for the audience here for infrastructure mid-century pathways um, that are ambitious in their climate change mitigation goal can inform short and medium-term investment decisions and help countries avoid stranding their assets or locking in higher levels of emissions in long-lived infrastructure. So this can ensure assets and infrastructure are, are low carbon, but also resilient to the future impacts of, of climate change. Um, but uh, thanks, Mama, I'll hand it back to you. Okay, um, thank you, Danny. So let's try to focus on an example. Uh, so you worked on the Tonga LTS, the long-term strategy. What specific foresight approaches and tools were used in the longest long-term strategy? Yeah, sure. So over the last two years, along with my colleagues from the Global Green Growth Institute and Relative Creative, we've been supporting the Tongan government to develop its, submit its long-term strategy to the UNFCCC. Uh, like all foresight work, the development of these strategies is complex, it's difficult, and it's really there's a lot of uncertainty. And you're talking about country uh, like Tonga, which, if you know about, it's quite remote. It's in the Pacific Ocean. Um, you know, there's some studies that predict it will its main city will be underwater um, by 2060. So really, people who are grappling with um, like those in the Philippines with climate change already, it's not a future thing. It is a now. Um, so we really tried to address, address this uncertainty by using culturally relevant and participatory processes. So I'll talk to two of those now. Um, so we did use cultural um, me metaphors and, you know, something that Shaquille talked about in terms of building narratives. And we use this not only as a visual storytelling aid, but also to carry the strategic dialogue. And one of those metaphors, which was obviously developed with the Tongan government and sense checked with cultural kind of champions to make sure we we're using it appropriately was the use of um, or the practice of creating a feta aki 
uh, which is a cloth map made from bark. It's quite a strong Tongan, Tongan tradition. It's usually performed by women and it's used to create a nagato or a tapa cloth, which is decorated with kupesi or a certain type of design. These mats are everywhere in cultural and community events and the metaphor of making nagato was selected for its significance. So we said in the same way that the nagato must be made from local materials, made you know, by local women and local community members, Tonga's climate future sh should also be made by uh, Tonga's people. So we also, the second point is we really demonstrated how different foresight tools could be used within this process and, and blended within cultural metaphors. Uh, so it's really, you know, it's a foresight's a way of thinking about the future of anticipating elements that will define it. I do have some photos that hopefully I can share my screen for. And you can see here just the, the process here around how the stakeholders actually came together. I should mention here shops we had where all civil society, private sector, all ministries of government were invited, youth and church groups. So here we have a really mixed group. There's a woman in the hat in the background who's about 90 and she's a great champion for climate change and progressive action in, in Tonga. Uh, so we used foresight theory and practice, as I said, and it, but we also tried to relate it to local concepts. And so in this first photo, you can see the Fetaaki map um, is on a long bit of paper over the over the table there, and it's in the shape of a futures cone. Mm -hmm. So if you're familiar with foresight theory or futures theory, futures cone is a method to portray how our ideas for the future fall into a number of categories. So that is probable or likely, plausible, could happen, and possible, might happen. So here's an, a completed example of that uh, futures cone, and you can see we actually did a lot of it in Tongan language there so you can see the different um, P's, the three P's as they're often called. And so you can see how participants use the intervention cards, which are these tangible cards here and which came from the workshop prior to place along the futures cone or the Fetaaki map as they were considering the likelihood of each intervention in the process and how they might link together. Mm -hmm. We also used a foresight tool called multi-level perspective or MLP. It's um, a tool that posits that transitions come through interactive processes with three analytical levels, macro, meso, and micro. In uh, the second workshop, we also use them to inform a workshop activity to determine the complexity and resistance to change. So you can see here lots of bits of paper and lots of movement and color and uh, annotation from the stakeholders. But basically what they're doing here is placing interventions across these three levels of scale and change and also mapping them out over time. So once again, just considering those trade-offs, benefits and interactions between all of the interventions that they want to see for their climate change mitigation plan. Stop sharing there. But really in the process of, of doing this with Tonga and with their government, yeah. we saw that foresight theory and tools can be used to consider in climate, in climate change mitigation, which is it's quite new to use foresight in this particular type of um, process, but you can also use cultural uh, context and metaphors, and actually, it's pretty critical in order to build that narrative and the story around the change. So, as both Mr. Uh, Kishore and Mr. Ahmed have said, what's important is not just that written output, that kind of hard planning process, but the practice of considering the future and considering options and making iterative decisions. Uh, but I'll leave it there and hand it back to you, Bama. Okay, thank you, Danny. Uh, that was very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, we will also cover the specific application of future snake foresight tools in adaptation in our second part. And uh, I would like to also encourage participants to uh, raise questions to our panelists in the chat box, and then we will address them um, as we go in the discussion. Now I would like to invite our colleague um, Arndt. Um, he's our for one of our foresight champions in ADB hear more from Arndt about why the transport sector became the first in line to really deep dive into this foresight approach in the ADB and how does he see this playbook and train cards being used by other stakeholders? Arndt, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Bama, and uh, greetings to you all. I wish I could be there in Delhi right now. Um, basically, uh, the transport sector is one of those large portfolios in ADB with a lot of tradition, a lot of expertise. 
And frankly, ADB has built lots of infrastructure around Asia. So why take this sector that's so established, and you can already imagine why that is, for foresight exercises? Because we need to think about how this could look like in the future. We can't forever build roads and railroads. We have to think about new types of transport that are going to be used by people in the future. What do future generations need? And there are some very critical aspects of the transport infrastructure that I've pointed out here, which make it very important to apply foresight and futures thinking. For, uh, transport projects have very long life cycles. It takes years to go from initial planning to design and to construction. And we need to be ever more efficient in using financial resources that are becoming more and more scarce. Transport infrastructure, but also generally infrastructure is impacted by future social, technological, economic, environmental, and political context. Not just the ones of now, but the ones of the future. And these infrastructures are exposed to a wide range of risks. I don't need to tell this audience that includes disasters. We need to design for tomorrow's reality, not really for today's, because the infrastructure that we now design is gonna be used for generations. So with this in mind, we started working on the transport sector with various people in the bank, but also other external experts and um, counterparts of ADB. And we produced these three products that you can find on our website now after a long gestation period. Uh, and maybe somebody can post the link into the, uh, uh, the, the platform that people are using. There's a report, there's a playbook, and there's trend cards. My task now is to just showcase this product as an example of how you can apply foresight in your respective context. Apart from this report, I wanna to go to what Shaquille has mentioned, narratives, stories. A report on its own doesn't do all that much to people. It doesn't move you much. But we decided that we wanted to invite some voices of futurist young people in various parts of Asia to look at this report and think about what this means for them and how they can imagine a future where the things that we talk about in the report become a reality. We produce various narratives of what we call personas, people in the future, were telling us about their life in the future and how they live that reality, that future reality. And then we decided to also interview these futurists and ask them, well, how did you do that? How did you get from the report to this narrative? All very interesting material that will soon be featured in another webinar, which we would invite everyone to join. And that's coming up in a couple of weeks. But the report is already online for you to look at and this is how it looks like inside. We have uh, various trends that we identified. We looked at the implications of these trends on the transport sector. And there it's a lot of things that lie outside the expertise of usual transport planners. What futures do we want? And how can we get there? What are the principles that we need to apply? Out of the principles would then arise some strategies. And this was done for all of Asia and the Pacific so I kept saying during the entire process that we need to actually prepare ourselves to contextualize this work. This doesn't mean much at a regional level, and you need to, when you are designing a project or when you're working at, on a national strategy, you need to think about your context and how this plays a role. And for that purpose, we have a playbook. Mm -hmm. The playbook goes along the report and actually gives you four pathways of how to work through this material using these worksheets in workshops. So you could take the report, you can take our trend cards, which we have 10 of, and you can very easily with this playbook, play around with this material and make it your own, contextualize it to your context. These are the four user journeys. The first one is about mapping trends, a very typical activity in Foresight and Futures work. What are the current things that we see emerging, the signals out there, and how do we make sense of them? Also questioning your own uncertainties, where you are saying, oh, well, actually, I don't know about this at all. I, I'm uncertain about the future. And recognizing those is hugely important in foresight work. 
then you could look at, with the playbook, a pathway of enhancing the future readiness of your projects, testing them against certain futures. You could develop a strategy using this uh, material, or you could create your own vision statements that look at the desirable futures that you see coming, or maybe also the ones that you think are not desirable and that would, one needs to navigate against. So these are examples of how to use the playbook. And that's just a showcase of this work, which was quite a process to come uh, through, but uh, a very exciting one that I'm very passionate about. Thanks for the opportunity to share. Thank you, Arndt. And uh, as a next plan, are you planning any follow-up projects? And uh, do you think other sectors will, will follow what you have done? Yes, I think uh, Susan would tell you that we have overwhelming demand. Yeah. It's it's actually very few people in ADB so far, but a growing number of people that can engage with this methodology. It's not that it's not rocket science to learn, but one needs a little bit of practice. And so this is growing. And on the demand side, we have many different teams that are saying this is this could be useful for our planning, for our project design. And in fact, this transport sector work is now leading to concrete follow-up at country level, where we now take these tools and contextualize, just like what I presented should be done, a pathway forward to digest this material, which, which otherwise would just go in onto a shelf or lie as a, as a nice uh, publication of ADB uh, you know, on a, on, a, on a tabletop. That's not the point, the point. It's really about shifting our thinking and our action now so that we can be more better at, at anticipating the future and produce future ready projects and, and partnerships with our counterparts in country. Thank you, Arndt. And uh, we have shared the link of the ADB transport work in, in the chat. And we also invite uh, participants to send us questions in the chat box and we will try to address them. For, uh, in due to time, let's move to the, our next session. Uh, to understand about how, how we can use the climate adaptive policy pathways. And this methodology enables decision makers to adapt the adaptation plans based on the changing conditions. And this session will be facilitated by our colleague, Alessio Giardino. He's a senior water specialist. He worked in Deltares, who, will, who has developed this uh, methodology uh, and that we will be exploring. And we are pleased to have Gundula Winter from Deltares uh, to guide us through this methodology. So over to you, Alessio. Yes, thank you very much, Pam. And uh, good morning, afternoon or evening. And uh, very well, uh, welcome to the second part of the session on dynamic adaptive policy pathways. And also, of course, thanks to CDRI for uh, hosting this uh, session. Um, the six uh, IPCC uh, assessment report is indicating, in fact, that there is a narrowing window of opportunity to shift pathway towards more climate resilience development. At the same time, while there is pressure for climate adaptation and this, this pressure is increasing, the risks of maladaptation are also rising. So flexible and robust adaptive plans uh, are required to reduce this, uh, these risks. And in this session, we will be discussing methodology to develop uh, adaptive approaches, which are both robust and flexible. And uh, without any further ado, I would like to introduce you to uh, our speaker of today, Dr. Gundula Winter. Uh, Dr. Gundula Winter is an advisor research uh, uh, on coastal uh, risk and climate adaptation at the TARS. She has more than 10 years of experience in coastal engineering, flood modeling, and also served as a contributing author for the six uh, IPCC assessment report. Uh, Dr. Gundula Winter, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alessio, for your kind introduction, and also thank you to the ADB and CDR for inviting me to the session. Um, I'd also like to thank the previous speakers, and I was uh, very interesting to listen to you, and I was intrigued, for example, to hear from Danny Robertson and uh, see how planning for climate mitigation links to and also has some similarities with planning for climate adaptation. And, uh, and I also got from what Aunt Huzar presented that a link what I'm going to talk about to the process that he presented on. Um, so uh, let me share my screen. Um, 
I'd like to talk about the methodology on dynamic adaptive policy pathways that help plan for an uncertain future. Um, so to start with, let me take you to a small island. Um, consider a village uh, in a small island state made up of around 150 households. Life in the village is generally good, with the villagers having a strong relationship with the sea. A majority of the households earn their livelihoods through fishing, so they choose to live in a series of hot um, small timber houses close to the beach, as you can see in this image here. Um, but it's just an example. Palm trees surround the houses, providing shade from the hot tropical sunshine. Um, and the sandy beach, uh, which is approximately 50 meters wide, stretches down to the shore um, from the tree line. Um, and the community has lived in this way um, for many years, but in recent times, the villagers noticed that the shoreline in front of their houses appears to be receding every year. There's less and less beach in front of the houses, and during large storms, waves now almost reach up the houses. A uh, big recent storm um, caused a recession of the beach um, up to 30 meters in front of the houses. And now after the storm, the beach slowly uh, recovers. Um, so this is an example of what it uh, looks could look like now. So now next imagine uh, you're in local government and the newly agreed national adaptation plan requires all local governments to develop plans to climate change. So now you start thinking and you know you need to consider the effect of climate change on sea level rise, also on storms, but you also need to consider how the demographics on your island might be changing in the future. So there are a lot of uncertain things um, to consider and you don't have an idea clearly of how the future will pan out. So what would you do? Um, your options are you could construct a seawall um, to protect the houses or you could undertake frequent beach replenishments that replace the sand that has been lost to erosion. Or you could implement setback lines, meaning that people have to move further back from the shore um, where they have their fishing boats. So what option do you think would be best? How will these options perform in different climate change scenarios, um, liberalize and demographic scenarios? Um, and can we be sure about what the future will look like? What is more likely? What is less likely? Um, so it is clear that under this deep uncertainty, decision makers should aim for robust plans that can be adapted over time. And this is why Dotar has uh, developed the dynamic adaptive policy pathways approach that is meant to support decision makers in planning making um, with a structured framework. So it is a systematic adaptive planning framework that explicitly considers decision making through time. It breaks down big decisions into manageable steps over time, keeping options for the future. And it specifies short-term actions and thresholds um, that clearly mark when additional actions are needed. So as such, the dynamic adaptive policy pathways approach recognizes that adaptation is a path. There's not one um, path uh, to the solution, but there are many possible paths. And we may need to adapt or change our course of action or switch to another path as new information comes to light uh, in the future. So this approach really helps focus on important questions under deep uncertainty, such as what are low regret actions that we can take now to the, um, and that contribute to future goals? 
and also importantly, don't hinder future actions. And what robust and flexible strategies perform well over a wide range of futures. So on the right, you see a stylized pathways map, um, which will be explained in a short informative video about the dynamic adaptive policy mm -hmm. pathways mm -hmm. approach. The adaptive pathways approach is modeled on the idea of a metro map. Its essence are sequences of measures over time, or pathways, that reach specified objectives. In this illustration, there are four potential actions. Actions A and D are robust. They can withstand a lot of sea level rise and still meet flood risk objectives. Other options are short-term actions, like action B. This could be, for example, the installation of booster pumps to improve drainage capacity. In this example, once action B reaches its tipping point, it needs to be augmented by action A or D. These sequences of actions over time are what we refer to as pathways. Each of the pathways meets the same specified objectives over the entire time horizon, but they each come with different costs, benefits, and co-benefits, which are used to evaluate, together with stakeholders and decision makers, which pathway is most preferred. So what would that mean for a little uh, um, imaginary island? So let's have a look at how that could pan out. Um, so you asked an engineering consultant to evaluate um, the options that you have and provide you with thresholds until when these options would be safe. So in the planning process, you first ask yourself, what are the objectives I want to meet? Probably safeguarding people's lives and livelihoods as fishermen. Um, next, are there other goals for development? Surely in local government, you want a thriving community. Perhaps you want to establish new sources of income. And what future trends are uncertain that you need to consider? Uh, it's the impact of climate change on storms and erosion, and it's sea level rise. So on the right side, you see the um, IPCC sea level rise projections um, from August 2021 and the different SSP scenarios. Um, and you see until the mid-century 2050, they're all still fairly close together. But then um, there's a big difference in the various scenarios, and also the high end, something that you might need to consider. So your engineering consultant uh, provided you with details about the option you're considering, and you now know what the tipping points of the three options you consider um, are, and you can start mapping out your pathways. So first, you draw your governing condition, which is sea level rise and you add the sea level rise scenarios you want to consider. Might come from IPCC projections, local project planning scenarios. You plot then the sell by date for the current situation and the sell by dates of the options that you're considering. Um, and we already see the seawall um, has an earlier tipping point than beach replenishments and the implementation of setback lines. This is now only valid for this example and will need to be um, always carefully assessed for each um, application. So now we can start to plot logical action sequences. So um, we can still make it work um, with options that have an earlier sell by date. So um, when the sell by date of seawall date is reached, we would need to um, take the next action and move on to consider beach replenishments or the implementation of setback lines. And we can also consider logical action combinations that will extend the life of any of these policy actions. So we can combine seawall with beach replenishments or beach replenishments with setback lines. So the 
you now have a small set of pathways and what you need to do now is engage with the stakeholders to choose preferred pathways. And for that purpose, Deltar has developed um, several tools for engagement. Um, we have developed the circle tool, which is an interactive um, tool that can be used with stakeholders and workshop setting to map critical infrastructures, their relations, um, and um, to assess cascading effects. For example, in a disaster event, um, when power supply fails, other critical infrastructure by, um, may also fail. And another tool that Dotaris has developed are serious games. Um, they work very well to raise awareness about future um, uncertainties and risks uh, and to train stakeholders in this pathways thinking approach. So now we come back to our island. Imagine you have consulted uh, all of relevant stakeholders and you can now identify the preferred pathway. In this example, it was pathway number four. First, replenish the beat, um, then implement setback lines, and then combine these setback lines with beach replenishment. Um, this is uh, this is less costly than seawalls and delivers the most uh, co benefit replenishments. Um, uh, keep a wide beach. Um, so this was obviously just an imaginary example. And uh, the Taurus has applied the framework um, in several real world examples, um, of which I want to highlight two. So we applied uh, the dynamic effective policy pathways approach in the Netherlands for long term adaptation pathways to potential high end sea level rise scenarios in the Netherlands, high end uh, and long term meaning. Uh, sea level rise in excess of two or three meters, uh, which is a huge challenge for a low-lying delta country uh, like. Um, so first, an inf inventory of adaptation options in the four solution spaces um, was made, and these four solution spaces that are considered in the Netherlands are to advance the coastline, to protect the coastline and close it off, uh, to protect the coastline and keep it open. That means um, that the rivers are still open uh, and there are dikes along the rivers to protect low-lying areas from flooding or to accommodate sea level rise. This can entail uh, relocation or uh, building flood proof. Um, so the current approach is protect open. The rivers are all open um, and dikes are built along the along the rivers and the rivers can be closed off very large storm surges. But this will not work anymore when sea level rise is higher and the rivers cannot freely flow into the sea anymore. Um, this is because uh, salt intrusion will become an issue. Agriculture won't be possible anymore. And if you have a large storm surge in combination with river discharge, um, then the river flood waves will become blocked and be discharged into the ocean. So the goal is uh, um, was to develop an adaptation strategy for the next one or 200 years and beyond, um, which will require transformational change um, in a delta area like the Netherlands. And that needs a lot of time. Um, so the theme here is anticipate the worst, but hope for the best. <laughs> and another example that I would like to highlight um, are the Marshall Islands. Um, they're low-lying um, at all, um, and they have limited uh, area of higher ground to retreat. Um, so we developed different pathways um, for different island types, uh, rural islands and urban islands. Um, 
And the current protection strategy um, will not be sufficient anymore as soon as uh, a sunny day tidal flooding will become so frequent and flood damages to storms unacceptably frequent um, that um, people cannot live there anymore. So um, develop different strategies considering um, uh, the different solution spaces, protect, raise, reclaim, um, and uh, Reclaim, uh, relocate, or migrate, and made a first order estimate of the cost that would be associated with pathways for sea level rise up to two meters, um, <clears throat> which provided useful information to the uh, Marshall Islands uh, government in the forming a strategy for adaptation. So, if you have any more, uh, so if you're looking for more information on the adaptation, Pathways approach, uh, you can visit our website at www.deltaros.nl and slash adaptive pathways. Okay. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Gundula. That was really insightful to see how this uh, methodology can be applied to develop robust and uh, flexible plans. Uh, I just have a quick uh, question, uh, also because we are a bit mindful of uh, time. And the question is, uh, you have shown how this uh, methodology can be applied to essentially develop a robust plan to deal with sea level rise, and how this methodology could be uh, applied, uh, for example, to develop uh, resilience uh, infrastructure, and uh, if so, what kind of changes you need to uh, implement in the methodology to make sure that this can uh, be actually done. Thank you. So um, your question was whether um, this would be applicable to critical infrastructure and disaster resilience. Um, yes, most certainly. Um, so um, this approach is specifically uh, well suited for projects with a long lifetime, uh, with large investments, and where the potential for, high re uh, for regret is high. So regret, I mean, overinvestment or under protection, lock-in scenarios, or stranded air. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. I think there is no other question. I think okay. I, I'll leave it to... Okay, yeah, um, I hope you can hear me also in the virtual world. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for illustrating how the narrative metaphor leads then to planning. And I think we have a question here from the audience. So um, let's, let's hear your question. Thank you. Uh, my name is John Carstensen. I'm climate change lead for Mott McDonald. Uh, we are applying some of our own tools to achieve the very same thing. Uh, one of my questions to you is, how do you deal with the aspects of political Isaac. economy analysis that might influence the outcomes? Yeah. The, the, the simple example is that you have a local influential businessman on the island that actually uh, produces uh, bricks and mortar and therefore pushes a particular solution as part of the political settlement on on that island, how how are you incorporating uh, that political economy dimension in uh, in your model? Thank, Thank you. you. Very excellent question. I mean, that's probably the the golden grail question to any work on resilience and climate change in the future. So let's hear from Gundula first, and then I, I guess everyone has a, a a thought how we can manage that. Gundula, how do you do that? Um, this this comes back to what Shaquille already mentioned is about having the right stakeholders in the room, and um, and how to how to manage that process. So I think um, and then which tools to use. So so the serious game approach, for example, can be something where you can make it a bit more abstract and and take um, potentially these tensions out of discussions. And when you put it into a gaming approach of fictive um, to sensibilize people about it. Um, yeah.
You worked with the Bangladesh government on education reform lately. I'm sure there was some resistance mm. too. How do you manage resistance and, and uh, vested interests or political economy? No, no, I think that's a, that's a great, um, it's a great point. I think, um, I think in, in our case, um, like we know that, um, yes, I, mean, I agree that there, there are different stakeholders that have um, different sorts of thinking. And I think there's a saying that policy is 10%, implementation is 90%, right? And this whole, uh, the, one stakeholder that just messes it up, right? That basically because of a lack of trust, yeah. things don't go on. Trust over the vision, over the plan, over over whatever we want to achieve. And I, I do think that uh, to, be, to be very honest, like you can't impose your thought, you can't impose your plan on people, right? I mean, you can try in some societies, it might, might work, but at some point it's going gonna, it's gonna to fail. And I think um, it's important, therefore, that that we listen, Right to the, the particular stakeholder that that you want to work with, we do talk about this idea that there are different people. There are people who are already believe in the power of change. There are some people who are completely against resisting resisting the change. The majority of people are asleep; they don't care. They just want to go home at the end of the day. And there are some people who will potentially change. Right, and I think yes. sometimes we spend a lot of our energy on the resistors. But I think uh, the idea is that how can you can you get a critical population of people who are uh, who are who are there with you? Yes. Uh, I think that's important, but I think on the last point, um, yeah, I mean, I think I've seen 180 degree turns in people in their thinking just because there was a level of trust, right? Yeah. That there, and yeah. I didn't have to pitch anymore. They automatically came up with whatever we wanted to achieve. And I think it's a, it is human relationships at the end of the day. I don't think any, any amount of paperwork will achieve Thank that. Thank you, Shakir. So we have to, unfortunately, end the session. I would have loved to hear from Danny how uh, you are managing uh, the political economy with long-term strategies. But I think this is for another session. So we do hope to see you all again and have more conversations. And this was just kind of a sneak preview of the work we are doing, how we are linking narratives, uh, changing mindsets with hard data and pathways and planning. And I do hope we all leave from this event today to say the minority will be the majority. And with that, thank you very much all for contributing to the session. And thank you, CDI, for allowing us to host this. And um, have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you.